Israel is now entering the, the final days of what is a bizarre and counterintuitive election. And it's counterintuitive because on the one hand we're facing a series of unprecedented threats which I wouldn't hesitate to call existential. When we look around at our borders, we see terror enclaves virtually on every, on every spot, something unprecedented in, uh, in, in our history. We have Hezbollah in the north and Hamas in the south. We have Al-Qaeda on the Golan. We have Al-Qaeda in Sinai. And so when an Israeli looks around the map of the Middle East, we see a region that is disintegrating, that is imploding. Our relationship with the Palestinians is once again at a, uh, we always say an all-time low, but we manage to always find a new all-time low. Our relations with the United States, with the administration, are perhaps at an all-time low and seem to be heading uh, even more intensively in that direction. Iran may well be about to approach the nuclear threshold, if not, the, if not crossing the finishing line. And yet, these elections are about none of these issues. These elections are not about the peace process, they're not about Iran, they're about the cost of living, they're about the housing crisis in Israel, they're about the price of the milky pudding. And these are the most domestic elections that arguably we have had since, since the Six Day War. And there are several reasons for this. One is that Israelis, by and large, are pragmatic people. And we know that there's really not much we can do to change the Middle East. We know we can't solve the region's problems. Most Israelis believe that the collapse of the peace process is not only or perhaps even primarily Israel's fault. The crisis in relations between Netanyahu and Obama has not harmed Netanyahu in a significant way for a very simple reason. Obama is the least popular president in the history of Israel. Uh, Jimmy Carter in his day was more popular than Obama is today. So if you regard the region and the world in, through Israeli eyes, you come to the conclusion that we might as well deal with the problems that we have kept deferring over and over, after every election, we continuously have deferred our internal inconsistencies. And so now the Israeli public has had enough and we're voting on domestic issues. I think there's a deeper reason for why we're seeing an outbreak of domesticity in uh, Israeli politics. And that is because we crave normalcy. The more out of control the region gets, the more Israelis crave a normal politics, a politics like any other country. Every other country, every other democracy, people go to the polls and vote on bread and butter issues. We want to be normal as well. We don't want to be defined constantly by a politics of existential need, of urgency. And yet, we know that our dilemmas are, in fact, existential. Whether it is Netanyahu in Congress warning about a, an existential threat from without, or whether it's Amos Oz in today's, new, in today's Los Angeles Times warning about an existential threat within. The language that we use to define our dilemmas is justifiably, from my point of view, existential. In the past, when the Jewish people, the state of Israel, faced existential dilemmas, the result was a clarity of purpose and a unifying pull in, that allowed us to respond to whatever threat was at hand. The problem that we face today, the tragedy that we face today is that we are not only confronted once again by a series of existential threats, 
but we as a people are no longer capable of defining what those existential threats are. We all agree that Israel faces existential threats. We can't define among ourselves what those threats are, and the problem is even more severe than that. Each camp identifies an existential threat in the opposite way as the other camp. And I'll play this out through the course of this, uh, of this discussion. Iran, for example. Netanyahu's argument is that if we allow the deal that is emerging to go through, Iran will be positioned to be the next North Korea. And the real argument I think that Netanyahu is making is that the will of the Iranian regime to achieve nuclear capability is clearly stronger than the will of the international community to stop them. And if that's the case, and if you allow Iranian capabilities to remain more or less intact, it is just a matter of time and circumstance before Iran slips across that threshold and becomes an active nuclear power. And so, from that point of view, the sense of urgency is profound, and if we really are on the edge of an existential threat, of a Holocaust-denying regime that is religiously apocalyptic and committed to Israel's disappearance, just the other day, uh, I think it was uh, Zarif uh, was interviewed, and uh, he said that the Netanyahu government has to be eliminated. I was thinking, you know, such a strange use of, of language for, in, in, in for, for changing the government. And they can't help themselves. Even when he was clearly trying to restrain himself and not talk about how we need to destroy the state of Israel because he was speaking in English, they're on the verge of an, of an agreement. Nevertheless, the, the exterminationist language simply is, 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 is part of this regime's DNA in relationship to Israel. So preventing this regime from getting the ultimate weapon would clearly be an existential issue that would require us to enter into a state of emergency. On the other hand, those who oppose Netanyahu, those who oppose his appearance in Congress, argue forcefully and credibly that what Netanyahu has done is formalize a growing split between Republicans and Democrats over Israel. He has undermined the foundation of AIPAC's success these last decades, which is based on bipartisanship. The fact that Israel was the only, virtually the only bipartisan issue in Congress. And that this too, in its way, could be such a severe security blow to Israel that it might in the long term also be a kind of existential threat. And if we follow Netanyahu's logic to the end, and if Israel launches a unilateral strike against Iran, which I believe is still possible, then we know that the consequences will be massive missiles on Tel Aviv, from Hezbollah, from Iran, perhaps Syria, perhaps Hamas. And if we don't have the United States at our side, we may well find ourselves in the worst security situation we have been in since 1948, certainly the worst attack on the home front since 1948, without any real international support. So those who oppose Netanyahu's policy can likewise make a credible case that Netanyahu is leading us toward the existential abyss. On the Palestinian issue, those of you who read Amos Oz today, and it's well worth reading him. Clearly, the language, the warning is, is apocalyptic. Amos Oz says, if we don't create two states, it will be one state. And it will not be one state on our terms, it will end up being an Arab state, which means that failure to create a two-state solution will, God forbid, lead to the destruction of the Jewish state. That is the stark argument of the left, articulated by Amos Oz, and the, a Palestinian state must be established immediately, immediately. 
And it's not a coincidence that he's publishing that essay on the eve of the elections because his warning is that if this government returns to power, Israel is in existential threat. Now, if you read Naftali Bennett, the head of the, uh, of the Jewish Home Party, he had an essay, an op-ed the other week in the New York Times. Naftali Bennett also makes a compelling existential argument for why we cannot create a Palestinian state. His argument is that if we withdraw from the West Bank, what will happen there is likely to repeat what happened in Gaza when we withdrew, which is sooner or later Hamas will take over that state. If we redivide Jerusalem, we could find ourselves sharing Jerusalem with Hamas, which is another way of saying that Jerusalem, God forbid, will not be a viable city. It will face, God forbid, Hurban destruction. And so you have two compelling, opposing existential visions, warnings, in relation to the Palestinian issue. This is a profoundly disorienting moment for the Jewish people. We're facing unimagined moral complications which are not only the result of the ongoing occupation, I don't minimize the moral consequences of the occupation, but I would say it is no less the relentless Arab assault on Israel's being, the siege that we have been under for, for nearly seven decades that has also eroded the moral fiber of parts of Israeli society. This summer, we experienced an inconceivable moment the burning alive of a 16-year-old Arab boy. If you had asked, I think, any of us before that event, would this be possible? Can we imagine that happening? I think we all would have said, not that. Jews don't do that. We can no longer say those very precious and comforting words. Jews won't do that. So there has been a profound loss of innocence. In these elections, Baruch Marzel, a disciple of Meir Kahana, may well end up a Knesset member, courtesy of Eli Yishai's party. We're seeing an outbreak of racism on the streets of Jerusalem. I've seen it. I've seen it repeatedly. I've seen it on the train, the light rail train, which I take from my neighborhood in French Hill downtown. And the kinds of open, naked rage, hatred, that, uh, have, that were very rare in the past are now erupting in Israeli society. So that's one part of the dilemma we're facing. The other part of the dilemma we're facing is that many Jews wonder whether the 1930s in some fashion are returning. We look at Europe, European Jewry is burning. European Jewry may no longer be viable. We may be seeing the end of 2,000 plus years of Jewish history in Europe. And so we look at the BDS movement. We look at the growing criminalization of Israel around the world, transforming the Jew once again into humanity's favorite symbol of evil. And we ask ourselves the question, are we once again heading back toward victimization? So who are we? Who are we? On the one hand, occupiers. On the one hand, racism breaking through Israeli society. On the other hand, Europe, BDS, world isolation. Is this a time for Jewish anger at the world? Or is this a time for Jewish shame? Perhaps both. We seem to be dividing as a people between those who are capable of either rage or shame. My generation, and I think I can, looking around here, I think I can more or less safely say our generation. Our generation came of age in the 1960s, 1970s, at a time of, of exquisite moral clarity for the Jewish people. Everything seemed very clear to us then. 
We were just in the aftermath of the Shoah. We were just beginning as a people to come to terms with the Shoah. We were protesting in the streets for Soviet Jewry. There was no more moral, clear campaign issue than saving Soviet Jewry, the last Jewish community of Eastern Europe. It was the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War that defined our Israel. And so today I, I sense in us an unconscious craving for a return to that time of moral clarity for the Jewish people. Because we're in a time now where nothing is clear. Everything is, 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 seems ambiguous. Or maybe to put it more precisely, it is clear but in opposing ways. It's clear to Amos Oz and it's clear to Naftali Bennett. But in reality, nothing is clear. And so we crave that lost sense of moral purpose and clarity and unity. Recently, there was an article in, uh, in one of the Jewish news websites, banner headline, Emergency Airlift to Israel of 21 Ukrainian Jews. And I really savored that headline because it is completely inappropriate to our reality today in the sense that there is no need anymore for emergency airlifts of Jews from anywhere. The Jews in Ukraine, if they are under threat, can simply get on a plane anytime. They don't need an emergency airlift. But this is something deep in us that wants those days of emergency airlift to return. And so there it was, emergency airlift. 21 Ukrainian Jews airlifted to Israel. In a time of intensifying confusion, there is a growing temptation for simplistic thinking. And so we have one camp, the camp of the left, which, and again, and this is a simplistic generalization, nevertheless, one camp which seems to be able to be most passionate about threats to the Jewish people, existential threats that are generated from within us, the occupation, the refusal to create a two-state solution, the growing, the growing rise of racism in Israel. The much of the left seems able to be exercised only when it comes to internal threats to our well-being, threats that we ourselves have created. On the right, there are many who seem to be most exercised and, and even exclusively exercised by threats that come from without, whether it's Iran, whether it's an imploding Middle East. And so what we have today in Jewish life is what I would call the camps of the half-right. And I don't mean right-wing, I mean the half-correct. And that's certainly what I felt reading Amos Oz today. I agreed with most of what he said. I questioned his timetable about the urgency of creating a Palestinian state immediately. And I felt I resonated with Amos Oz's passion, his love for Israel, his, 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 his deep understanding of what a threat the occupation has been to Israel. And Amos Oz, in the summer of 1967, wrote what might have been the very first article that appeared immediately after the Six-Day War in the labor newspaper, the late labor newspaper, Davar, uh, where he warned that there is no such thing as a good occupation. Summer of 67, when most of the Jewish people was in a state of euphoria, Amos Oz saw fairly clearly where an occupation would lead us. But the problem is that he's so focused on the dangers of occupation that he doesn't see the dangers of a Palestinian state. He pays lip service to it in the article. And, and the camp of the half-right always pay lip service to the concerns of the other side, but only to debunk those concerns and to immediately proceed to their argument. And I think that you know, one of the, the uh, Laura mentioned the, the, the book that I published last year, 
uh, like Dreamers, which is about the left-right divide. And one of the mysteries that I struggled with while I was writing that book was trying to understand how was it that for 30 plus years, left and right shouted past each other and neither camp listened to the warnings of the other. The left was arguing powerfully, credibly, about the demographic dangers of occupation, the danger to our democratic and Jewish soul. The right was arguing credibly about making a deal or trying to make a deal with a national movement, a Palestinian national movement, that doesn't recognize our right to exist in any borders. Why wasn't it, why didn't we have a real debate between these two camps all those years? Why didn't they listen to each other? And when I moved to Israel in, uh, in 1982, I tried to teach myself Hebrew by watching TV, paying attention to the, to the Hebrew programs. And in those years, most of Hebrew programming was very serious. It was mostly news and talk shows. And there was one talk show called Popolitika. Some of you may recall it. And it wasn't so much a talk show as a shouting match. People, literally, people were sitting there shouting past each other. And I would go very close to the screen to try to hear what they were saying, to try to understand the Hebrew. And, uh, and then even the moderator would join in the fray, and he would shout. And I couldn't understand, you know, why, how is this, and the show had tremendous longevity. I couldn't understand why was it that Israelis, week after week, turned into Popolitika, and how is it that these people were just shouting past each other? And finally, I understood that the purpose was not to convince the other. The purpose was to state your truth. Because you know, you know you're right. And Amos Oz from his place is right. And Naftali Bennett from his place is right. They are both speaking from a profound place of existential fear. And when I travel around the Jewish community and speak, either in an orthodox synagogue, not this one, this one is a little bit different, and, uh, or in liberal synagogues, the response that I'll get from people in the audience is, well, don't you see, don't you understand? And it's almost the identical language, except that the existential fears are, are different. Don't you see what the occupation is doing to us? Don't you see what a, a, a withdrawal from the West Bank will do to us? And my response is yes. Yes to both. What we are experiencing, beginning to experience, in this period of maddening ambiguity is a return to certain modes of pre-Holocaust Jewish thinking. Sovereignty is messy and Israeli sovereignty particularly so. And so there is a longing for a pre-sovereign time that we're beginning to see in certain circles in the Jewish community. A longing for moral simplicity, for moral clarity. Power corrupts, a longing for powerlessness. We are seeing a return of pre-Holocaust Jewish anti-Zionism. We're seeing it in certain organizations that are still fringe, but nevertheless growing. We're even seeing a return to the old mode among certain circles of blaming ourselves for anti-Semitism. Why is there a rise in anti-Semitism in Europe? It's because of Israel, it's because of the occupation. I had a conversation with a, with a very close friend of mine, I won't mention his name, a well-known figure on the Jewish left, who said to me, there is no real anti-Semitism happening. It's all a result of the occupation. And this is someone close to Israel, a Zionist. And so there is the occupation and the moral complexity that is generated is, is, is creating a, a, a revival of a mode of thinking, of self-blame for anti-Semitism, which the Holocaust had seemed to end forever. It was once a very strong psychological tendency among Jews, and now we're seeing that reemerge. On the right, we're seeing a different kind of pre-Holocaust thinking emerge, which is the whole world hates us, we have no friends, 
and we are eternally besieged. As if there was no interfaith transformation, no Vatican II, uh, as if uh, we haven't experienced in recent decades the largest wave of conversions into Judaism in our history, as if Netanyahu didn't just get I don't know how many dozens of standing ovations in Congress, as if India, one of the world's significant countries, isn't passionately pro-Israel. Nevertheless, we are alone, we are universally hated, and that too is an expression of a craving for clarity in this time of deep confusion. So how then to navigate the confusion? And what I'd like to suggest is not a policy, not going to present a policy to you, but more a sensibility. And as a basis for how we can begin to create policy. And the starting point for this sensibility is first of all very simply acknowledging that what makes our debates so bitter, what makes the nature of Jewish argument in this time so hard is that we are arguing over existential issues and we have opposing understandings of the nature of these existential threats. Even, ironically, the, this, I spoke earlier of the, 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 domest, the domesticization of Israeli politics. When you listen carefully to Israeli politicians argue a domestic agenda, even that is, cou is, is couched in, uh, in existential terms. If we don't change the Israeli economy, if we don't solve the housing crisis, our young people are going to begin to leave. We're going to lose our, our, our ability to, to hold together as one society. And this is a life and death issue. And so what we are facing in one way or another, at least in terms of our perceptions as a people, is we are facing multiple existential threats. Now, that doesn't mean that we need, in this search for, for a, a civil Jewish discourse, and the question really is how do we hold together as a people while, while, we, are, while we are in the midst of existential dilemmas, the, each of us will come to our own conclusions. Each of us will, will, will reach our own decisions. So for example, on Iran, my conclusion is that Netanyahu is right, and this is an existential moment as he defines it. And therefore, for all the reservations that I initially had about his speech to Congress, I felt we need to act with appropriate desperation. And we cannot let this moment pass quietly. Even, even at the terrible price of alienating large parts of the Democratic Party, to say nothing of open war now between Jerusalem and, uh, and the White House. Nevertheless, even as I affirm my position on this existential threat, I need to do so with a measure of uncertainty and hesitation and humility. I need to acknowledge that the other argument, the other side, is compelling as well. And so we are facing on the Iranian issue, as on the Palestinian issue, competing existential anxieties. On the Palestinian issue, I, my fears, at least today, and I've had different, I've, I've veered on this issue in the past, Today, when I see what is happening in the Middle East, when I see what is happening in the Palestinian national movement, my deepest fear, my, the greater fear for me is not the demography and the absence of a Palestinian state, but creating a Palestinian state. My greater fear is Hamas in Jerusalem. But that doesn't mean that I negate Amos Oz's fears, because those are my fears as well. And so I would define our dilemma as, on the one hand, fearing 
the absence of a Palestinian state, and on the other hand, fearing the creation of a Palestinian state. And those really, I would say, those are my two nightmares as an Israeli. I fear, I fear that there will not be a Palestinian state, and I fear that there will be. And again, at a certain point, what needs to reach policy decisions, but the sensibility, the ability to hold that complexity, to hold the two arguments, is essential for our health as a people. And I've often really puzzled about why, why is it so hard for us? Why do our arguments seem so one-dimensional? And Laura, you mentioned, you, 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 met, you quoted me there about the need for a multi-dimensional Jewish politics or personality. So much of Jewish politics seems one-dimensional, capable of holding only one existential fear or one idea at a time. And what we need is the wisdom of an old people, of an ancient people. Sim simplistic thinking is a hallmark of youth. It is the strength of youth, the passion to be able to be single-minded, to have one idea. But the absence of nuance is also a hallmark of youth. And when I look at us as a people, I wonder where is this, where is our ancient wisdom? Where is our ability to hold complexity? Why are we so shrill and single and one-dimensional in our debates? And I think that part of the problem is that we, our generation, we are heirs to two communities, the State of Israel and American Jewry, each of which were founded, was founded on the notion of a new beginning, in a sense of erasing a great deal of the past. In Israel, it was a very conscious ideological decision to erase 2,000 years of memory. We are now in a, in a process in Israel of re-Judaizing Israeli culture. We see it very strongly in Israeli music and other facets, Israeli film. There is a growing hunger among Israelis for, for different forms of Judaism, for some connection to Jewish practice. But what is happening, and this is a process of retrieving memory, but when memory has been interrupted, as it has been for several generations, both among American Jews and Israelis, and you then attempt to retrieve memory, the process of memory retrieval is awkward, and it can lead in its way to a kind of simplistic recreation of what we imagine the past to be, and there's no greater example of that than the Shas party. The Shas party uh, is, is committed to, to, to restoring the, the, the shattered glory of Sephardic Jewry, and how have they done that? By adopting the most hardline aspects of Ashkenazi Judaism. That's, that's, that, and, and Shas, it, there's something very touching about that. In this, in, this, in this inability, once memory has been severed, as it was for several generations of Sephardi immigrants, that rupture with the intact past, now to try to retrieve memory. And I think that that's where we are as a people, and I think it, it explains to some extent why it's so hard for us to act like an old, wise people. And so my plea is for a culture of debate, even over existential issues, especially over existential issues, that would begin to approximate what an old people might sound like. I'd like to say something, maybe end on a, um, on a personal note. And this is about uh, my book, Like Dreamers, which, just to briefly recap, is a kind of a history or a narrative history of the left-right debate uh, as it developed in the aftermath of the Six-Day War, and the book follows seven paratroopers who fought in Jerusalem, and some went to the left and some went to the right. And the book moves, the narrative device is to move in and out 
of different states of consciousness. So that when the book is writing about, is focusing on a left-wing character, the point of view of the book becomes entirely left-wing. When it shifts to a settler, the point of view of the book becomes right-wing. And this book took me 11 years to write, and one of the reasons for that was that I didn't hear for many years, I didn't hear a voice. This book had no voice. And every book has to have a voice, certainly for its writer. It has to have a distinct voice, even if you're the only one who hears it. And I didn't hear, the book was mute to me. And one day, and all it seemed to me was this cacophony of left, right, left, right. And then one day I finally realized that that's the voice of the book. The book is Israel arguing with itself. And I realized, and that was the breakthrough. As soon as I understood, as soon as I heard the voice, I was able to finish this, this endless project. And that voice was a reflection of my own internal Israeli voice. I became an Israeli in 1982, the summer of 1982, which was a very hard moment to enter Israeli society because that was the beginning of the first Lebanon war. It was the moment when Israeli society was not only failed to unite over, over war, the first time in Israel's history, but the war itself was what was dividing us. And I would walk around the streets of Jerusalem and see people literally shouting at each other on the street, traitor, Nazi, the, the, the whole thing. And I felt at that moment as a new immigrant that I had one of two choices, one, really one of two options in entering the society. I could either choose a camp, and many immigrants understandably do that. They find their Israel in which they're comfortable, the Israel that resonates with their values, with their, with their, with their social persona, and that becomes their state of Israel. The second alternative was for me to open myself to all of these competing angry voices and to try to listen carefully, not only about the Lebanon war, but about the Palestinians and Arab Israelis and religion and, and, and state, secular and religion, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, all of the schisms, and in those years, Ashkenazi and Sfaradi was a very major schism, to try to open myself and listen as deeply as I could and to internalize Israel's schisms so that these arguments were not just happening out there between rival camps, but in some way were happening inside of me. And the result of that was that I became a very confused Israeli because I heard the compelling truths on both sides, but it was also very clear to me from almost from the beginning that each side of whatever the debate was, was missing something essential that the other rival camp understood that each camp was speaking from a place of, of, of legitimacy and urgency of Jewish history, that Jewish history was speaking to us through these, these competing voices, and that we are, in fact, the sum total of our wanderings. And I realized that when I was drafted in, in, during the first Intifada in 1989, and I served in, in Gaza. My, my unit was sent to Gaza in the refugee camps. And I served with, I, I was close with two friends, both of whom happened to be African Jews. One from South Africa, one from Ethiopia. And as we were going through the patrols on a daily basis in the refugee camps, my South African friend was becoming increasingly demoralized. He said, I left South Africa to get away from this, and now we're heading back toward exactly the kind of society that I tried to escape. My Ethiopian friend had a completely different take. He said, they hate us. Look at the graffiti on the walls, and the graffiti in the refugee camps was 
the state of Israel with a sword piercing it and blood dripping out. It was the graffiti of genocide. And he said, look at literally the writing on the wall. It's us or them. What they want is to send my family back to the refugee camp in Sudan, and I came here to stay, and I'll do whatever I have to to protect this country. So that who we are as a people and what, how we relate to Israel is very often the result of our diaspora experiences, whether it's in South Africa or Ethiopia, or it's not a coincidence that Jews from the former Soviet Union mostly vote right, Jews from Argentina who fear the military, fear a military coup, vote left. So that we, we impose on our Israeli experience the wisdom and the fears of our wanderings. And my, my final plea, really, to all of us is to listen, to listen deeply to the anxieties and the wisdom of the rival camp because there is wisdom scattered throughout the Jewish political and religious spectrum. And developing a capacity for empathy, even as one affirms your values, your position, your political position, nevertheless, developing that capacity for empathy, that sensibility, is crucial for preserving our sanity as a people and for helping us navigate through this excruciating time of existential ambiguity. Thank you very much. Questions, yes? Speeches. Uh, do I, shall I call on people? Okay, please. Yes. I think the clearest example is the Palestinian issue. Yes, sorry. The, um, what would be a, a wise old people's response to any of these existential threats that we're facing? So let me suggest a, a, an approach to the Palestinian issue. It would be very simply acknowledging the, or more than that, embracing embracing the existential fears of Amos Oz about the, 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 about the ongoing occupation and embracing the existential fears of Bennett about ending the occupation in a way that would endanger, that could endanger us fatally. And, um, it, and then I would, take it, I would take it deeper. I would say that what makes the Palestinian issue so profoundly tormenting for us as a people is that it challenges our self-understanding as, as a humane people, as a people that remembers that we were strangers in the land of Egypt, on the one hand. And on the other hand, it's the Palestinian issue that has triggered the renewed demonization of Israel, the threats to Jewish life in Europe. So the Palestinian issue is also the renewal of, of, of a violent assault uh, on Jews physically and a certain violence against our narrative, against the legitimacy of our story. The Palestinian national movement is the pretext, the vehicle for undermining our legitimacy. And I, and I think that, that, that what makes this time so difficult as well for so many of us is that we're once again forced to defend our right to exist. Our right to exist, our legitimacy, is what's being challenged, and I think that that is maddening for the Jewish psyche. It is simply unthinkable that we are once again forced to defend the right of the Jewish people to exist in any form. And so, for all those reasons, I think that when we approach the Palestinian issue, we need to do it in the complexity that's missing, certainly when I read the Haaretz editorial pages, that complexity is, is virtually gone. 
And when I listen to, to the spokespeople on the right, when I listen to our politicians from the Likud or, 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 or the Jewish home, there is none of that, there is none of that nuance. And, and after 30, 40 years of, of arguing these issues, I think that what's happened in Israel at least is that a majority of Israelis, and this is borne out by the polls, have become centrist, which is to say a little bit left and a little bit right. We agree with the left about the occupation. We agree with the right about the peace. And that leaves us in a, in a kind of a stalemate against ourselves. So, yeah. It's a great question, and I have two answers. Yes, the question is, um, will the Palestinians go through with their threat to suspend security, and, and what will happen if they suspend uh, security cooperation with Israel? And uh, I have two answers for you. The first is I don't know, and the second is even if I did know, I don't think I would answer it, because I want us to focus on this, on this theme of how do we manage a civil conversation among ourselves when we have opposing existential sensibilities and fears. And the policy questions, which are really important, and I've just come from APAC, I was at policy conference there, those questions really belong in that framework. And in, in a Hartman framework, I'm going to restrain myself and not deal with, with policy issues. The question is uh, the, that how will Jewish Democrats, that, that minority of American Jews known as Jewish Democrats, how, how will they be affected by Netanyahu coming to Congress and, and seemingly forcing them to choose between Israel and, and, and American Jewry? Uh, I, um, I'll answer that question in a, in a slightly different way that will bring us back to this to this theme because I think it's, it's a very important component of the question of, uh, and, and, and I would even say an existential question, of the Israeli relationship with American Jewry. Uh, are we in danger of losing a large part of American Jewry? I think we all know the answer is yes. And that is a profound threat to Israel. And when I was trying to draw up a kind of a mental ledger of pros and cons for Netanyahu's speech, very high up on the list was uh, how this speech was going to uh, place uh, American, uh, American Jewish liberals in an, in an impossible situation. I had a, uh, an argument, a very heated argument, with a close friend of mine last week uh, in New York about the speech. This is a, a friend who I have never had an argument with, uh, a friend who is a passionate Zionist, and he was furious at Netanyahu for exactly that reason. And we had a, a, a virtually a shouting match. And one of the reasons that uh, I'm presenting uh, this topic in the way that I am today is, uh, is a result of that, of that argument and thinking, well, if, I, if I'm going to lose or risk my friendship with Sam, then something is profoundly wrong in our discourse and we are facing a, uh, an emergency. And that in itself, if we're already making lists of existential threats, tearing ourselves apart is itself an existential threat. But in adding that point on the ledger, and I looked at that, I said, okay, we're going to pay an enormous price for this speech. Is it still worth it? My feeling was because I feel so 
overwhelmingly committed to, to stopping Iran, and because I believe that no one will stop Iran if we don't, then I came out very reluctantly on the side of Netanyahu, fully aware that this was one of the consequences. Yeah, did you all hear the question? Um, why is it that Sephardim in Israel have, be, have turned to an Ashkenazi way of life rather than, uh, than renewing their Sephardi traditions? Uh, again, that will take us a little bit farther afield, so I won't give a, 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 a long answer. But uh, very simply, um, most Sephardim are not wearing black clothes. Uh, it, it is the Shas leadership and they have managed to touch a, a place of pride and grievance in uh, many Sephardi voters. But uh, I think this election might show some different trends. That, but again, that's really, I have to restrain myself because that's taking us away. Yes. The question is whether Netanyahu was self-sacrificing in coming here. I think that, that uh, and, and making his speech. I think that, um, that um, I don't know if this really has helped him electorally. Uh, I think that that was uh, a consideration, the, the electoral consequences, but I don't think it was the most important consideration for him. This has been his defining existential issue as prime minister and he is ready to fall on his sword for this issue, absolutely. I have a, um, the question is, uh, how do I as an Israeli voter see the coming elections in terms of, and as a centrist, in terms of holding both sides? Uh, I have, um, in, my, in my career as an Israeli voter, uh, voted for just about every winning prime minister since 1992. Uh, you can do the arithmetic. I've gone from Labour to Likud to Labour to, to Likud to Kadima to, and, um, and the reason for that, I think there are two reasons. One is that my political sensibilities as an Israeli are very average, very mainstream, and very pragmatic, and I'm looking to see what works. And the other reason, I think, is that, uh, like many other Israelis, I end up voting against myself and the mistakes I made in the previous election. So um, my, my feeling today is that I, I personally agree with just about uh, every issue uh, that Herzog uh, represents. Uh, certainly, I would, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm nowhere near as optimistic as he is about the chances of reaching peace with the Palestinians. In fact, I could say that I don't believe there is any chance for the foreseeable future of reaching a deal with this Palestinian leadership. Nevertheless, if he wants to keep trying, it will certainly make our position internationally more comfortable. I, um, I, I am more in sympathy with the domestic agenda of Herzog, certainly, than I am with the Likud, Bennett, the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, uh, with, one, with one overwhelming exception, and that's Iran. When I listen to Herzog speak about Iran, he offers platitudes. He will not come out against the deal that Obama is, is, is preparing. 
And I, can, I, I can't trust Herzog on this issue. I don't trust his, his existential sh uh, shrewdness on this issue. And so I'm left with this impossible dilemma where on the one hand, uh, Herzog's agenda represents a vision and a long-term agenda for Israel, which I do see as existential. I see maintaining our, our international standing, keeping us from becoming a pariah state, uh, making sure that our relations with the, with the strong majority of American Jews uh, remains viable. Uh, all of those reasons and more, uh, I feel that Herzog represents a better, a better option. And, uh, and, and I have a deep existential, existential fear of a right-wing ultra-Orthodox government leading us to the abyss, except for Iran. And that's my dilemma. In this election, it's existential fear versus existential fear. The question is, do people feel that they have a voice in Israel, that these elections matter? I, um, you know, it's interesting, a quarter of the electorate is still undecided, 10 days before the elections. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, in Israel, in the old Israel, that was inconceivable. Everybody belonged to their tribe, everybody voted tribally, and you knew as soon as you were born who you were going to vote for. And, uh, and it's really, it's, it's, it really was something like that. And this, to my mind, this is a much more interesting Israel. It's a much more dynamic and fluid electorate. And I think we may f wake up uh, after election day with some, with some very uh, interesting surprises. And all of them frighten me. <laughs> yes, sir. Netanyahu um, said in Congress that Israel is prepared to stand alone, and the question is, is that a viable option? And if there is, if there is a deal or if there is no deal, what, what are the options? Well, let's, let's leave that second question aside. In terms of Israel standing alone, look, when it comes to Iran, I am about as hawkish as one can be. And if it is, if, if this really is the moment that, that Israel has been claiming for, for 15 years, and that APEC has been claiming all these years, and this is the moment of truth, and I, I sense that it is, then, then no other considerations should, should, should affect what we need to do. And in that sense, I haven't come here to, to defend an Israeli preemptive strike on Iran. I've come here to, to lay out the complexities of our, of our debate. But so when, when, I, when, I, when I reach this conclusion, I'm very mindful of what it is that I might be risking. And what I might be risking, as I laid out earlier about the, the counter-argument to, to Netanyahu's position, uh, what, what that would risk is in its way also existential. War with Iran, Israel alone, can we really be alone? With in, in, in a war against Iran, if God forbid there are tens of thousands of missiles falling on Tel Aviv, which is a very realistic scenario. It's certainly the scenario that the army is, is, is preparing for. The army believes that that's what will happen. So I, I don't say this lightly, but I, I, I say it from a place of, of, of profound existential fear and 
at the same time trying, trying not to let that fear over, overtake me to the extent where I can't see the alternative argument. Because you know, what worries me is that, and this is also a facet of, our, of, our, of how we relate to each other in these existential debates. If I believe, for example, if I take the Amosos position that, that, that Bennett is posing an existential threat to Israel because Bennett wants continued settlement and he wants to annex parts of the West Bank, then I may have to reach the conclusion that I need to treat Bennett as an enemy of the Jewish people because he is an existential threat. Now, several people, some of them my friends, uh, prominent in the Jewish community, recently did precisely that. They came out with a letter saying that we are going to begin boycotting uh, Israeli leaders who are against the two-state solution, and, th and this letter mentioned Bennett specifically. Now, if that's the case, if that's a legitimate way in which we will conduct our existential debates, I have an existential issue as well, which is Iran. And that means that those Jews who support Obama on Iran are threatening me existentially. Do I then have the right or even the obligation to do what my friends want to do to Bennett and to do that to J Street, for example. J Street recently circulated a letter against Netanyahu saying, not in my name. Now that, that is supporting Obama against Netanyahu in what for me, for me, is an existential threat. Now if we're going to relate to each other only on the basis of our existential anxieties, we are going to become an even more dysfunctional people than we are now. Bennett, the left is going to, to, to boycott Bennett, and I'm going to boycott J Street, and there'll be lots of other boycotts in lots of other directions. And that, to me, is an untenable way in which a fa for a family to function, because families, as we know, can disintegrate. Families can end. And we are at a, at a very delicate moment in Jewish history where because there is this pressure on us in multiple directions, in the ways in which we're relating to the existential threats we're facing, that we could end up being a completely dysfunctional family that is no longer really a family anymore. And, if to start, and, and, and that was my response to my friends who wrote this letter about boycotting Bennett. One, I believe one needs to debate Bennett, one needs to vote against Bennett, but not to boycott Bennett. And I would say the same about J Street. I need to debate J Street, and I, as I, and I have done that, but not to boycott J Street. Yes. The question is um, the, that until recently, the growth of the ultra-Orthodox in Israel uh, was widely regarded as an existential threat, and I haven't mentioned it, do I regard it as an existential threat? Uh, I think that domestically we face uh, an, an, a long-term existential threat uh, in, um, in the following way. Uh, our two fastest growing populations are, are those communities that are most disconnected from the Israeli mainstream ethos. The ultra-Orthodox on the one hand, the Arab Israelis on the other. And it gets even more complicated because absorbing one into the ethos will mean, could mean, uh, excluding the other. So for example, the ultra-Orthodox one in Israel that is more Jewish and less democratic. Arab Israelis want an Israel that is more democratic and less Jewish. How do you square that? How do you, how do you, how do you absorb these two fast-growing populations to have some relationship with the Israeli ethos? 
Now, that is a whole conversation in itself. Yes, I do regard it as a, as a long-term uh, existential threat. As we say in Hebrew, lo chaser. We, we're, not, we're not missing, we're not lacking for existential threats. And, uh, and, but that's really, that's a whole conversation that, and, 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 a, and, a, and a crucial conversation, but it will take us in a, in a different direction. Yes. The question is, if, uh, if, if there is no chance for an agreement with the Palestinians anytime soon, is there a chance for unilateral withdrawal? Now, when you, I, I was a, a very strong supporter of the unilateral withdrawal from Gaza uh, because I saw the withdrawal as a, an attempt to create a new political place between the left and the right, and I think that's what Sharon had in mind. It was not an attempt to renew the peace process, quite the opposite. What Sharon was really saying was that the left is correct, we can't continue indefinitely occupying another people, but the right is also correct, we can't make peace with them. If you can't occupy, you can't make peace, we'll unilaterally determine our borders. Now, that position had a majority support when we withdrew from Gaza. It would not have anywhere near that support if we tried to withdraw from, uh, from Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, uh, partly because Judea and Samaria is not Gaza, the deep love that many, many Israelis feel for, for that part of the land, and also because of the bitter experiences we've had as a result of the withdrawal. And, um, and if, you, if you mention unilateral withdrawal to Israelis today, many of them will say that is the most dangerous existential threat because we'll be pulling out of that territory. We'll have, we'll have uh, Palestinian terror groups on the highlands overlooking Tel Aviv and Ben Gurion Airport without even getting a pretense of an agreement in return. Now, I'm not of that position. I think that under certain circumstances, we need to consider the possibility of a unilateral withdrawal as a last ditch attempt to save Israel from the scenario that Amos Oz lays, lays out. If we, we can't allow the Palestinian leadership to veto our ability to save Israel as a, as a Jewish and democratic state. So I still hold some form of unilateral withdrawal as a, as a last desperate option. That I think it would have to be done very differently. We would need to leave the army behind. We wouldn't just, we wouldn't pull out uh, we would pull out settlers, but not the army. We would not withdraw to the 67 borders the way we did in Gaza, and we certainly wouldn't redivide Jerusalem under conditions of unilateral withdrawal. Nevertheless, uh, I, I, even, even as I say it, I can already see, I can see a dozen holes in the argument uh, that would make a unilateral withdrawal, even under the conditions that I think uh, might be reasonable to be uh, a extremely dangerous gamble for Israel. It's a great way to put it. It's a great way to put it. That uh, in these elections, these ele what will be the outcome of these elections for these two populations, the Arab Israelis and the ultra-Orthodox, one population is being starved by the government, the other population is being overfed by the government. And that's, that's really a, a terrific way of summing it up. And, and the, the solution, the beginnings of a solution for, for the alienation of each of these communities are opposite solutions. The ultra-Orthodox parties, I believe, need to continue to be excluded from Israeli governments until we get the legislation in place that will normalize our relationship with that community and that will complete the transformation that the last government began, thanks to Yesh Atid, 
of, uh, of drafting ultra-Orthodox young men. That's one of the keys to mainstreaming the community. And in order to do that, you have to make sure that ultra-Orthodox politicians are not sitting at the cabinet table because they will sabotage it. So they need to be in opposition for another, at least another term of, uh, of, of another coalition. The Arab Israeli parties, now they've unified at least temporarily into one party, Ar Ar there need to be Arab Israeli politicians in the coalition. That for, to, to, to begin the process of integrating the Arab Israeli community, we need to see more, we need to see some Arab Israeli politicians at the table, provided, provided that they are not politicians who come either from the Islamist stream or the nationalist Palestinian stream. Ahmad Tibi is a nationalist, um, Zwabi is a nationalist. Uh, what we need are Arab Israeli politicians whose, whose agenda is integrationist, who are civil rights minded politicians and not nationalist politicians. The tragedy of, the, of Arab Israeli politics on their side, on our side, the tragedy is that we don't know how to behave as a, as a, as a self-confident majority and we're still acting toward the Arab Israelis as if we're the defensive fearful minority. But on their side, the tragedy is that they have not yet produced a credible politics that places integration at the top of their agenda instead of supporting the Palestinian nationalist movement. And if you look at the polls taken within the Arab-Israeli community, strong majorities that want their politicians to place domestic issues at the forefront. And, and I, there are some politicians who do that. They, they are in labor and merits. The Arab-Israeli politicians who are integrationist are not in the Arab party. What would a centrist Israeli vision be of a, a day after or the year after a successful Israeli strike on Iran? Uh, that's a really interesting question, and I don't know if anybody can give you an answer. I'll try, but I don't know what it's worth. That what I hope will come out of that is a transformation of the Middle East in a more positive direction, where we will see the beginnings of an open, I don't want to say the word alliance, it's too strong, but an open relationship between Israel and the Sunni world, which fears a nuclear Shiism at least as much as we do. And in terms of internal Jewish discourse, the realization that there are times in our history still today when we need to take external existential threats seriously and unite as a people. And I hope that, that those uh, voices that would oppose Israel would be uh, a minority. And that we see as a result of whatever consequences happen, and I think the consequences will be, will be very sobering in terms of the Israeli home front, in terms of threats to Jewish communities around the world. I think we're going to see an intensification of, of what we've been experiencing in the last, in the last months. That, that will bring us together. And, and you know, maybe I'll end really in, in, in looking at French Jews. So I think there's something, and, and if we're speaking about, about the state of the Jewish people 2015, I think it's, there's, it's appropriate to end with the French Jewish community. There's something really strange about the response of French Jews to the rise of violent anti-Semitism, of terrorism directed against them, which is that tens of thousands of French Jews are thinking seriously about moving to a country where they will be under even greater terrorist threat. And, and yet, this is, this, is, this is what passes for normative 
conversation in the French Jewish community today. Do we leave this threat and move to Israel? And I think that what French Jews are really saying is that they're not, they're not looking for personal safety. That's not their response. They are responding as a people. And what they're saying is we don't want to be in a position where we can't defend ourselves anymore. And I've heard French immigrants say that explicitly. We know that it's dangerous here, but here we have an army, here we'll protect ourselves, and I'm not at the mercy of uh, whichever French government is in power, which shows a certain deep lack of, of trust, even though I think this French government has been, has been quite uh, impressive in reaching out and, and trying to, to protect the Jews. But what the Jews are saying is we don't want to be protected. We want to protect ourselves. That's a profound statement. So if you're asking me what I would hope would be the result of, of, of an acute existential moment in, in Jewish history uh, in perhaps the coming months, uh, my hope would be that we would respond as a people more in the French Jewish mode, really take a page out of what we're seeing happening to the Jews of France, who are not panicking, they're not fleeing. If they were fleeing out of panic, out of fear of personal safety, they wouldn't be going to Israel or thinking of going to Israel. So I would hope that the Jewish people would be inspired by French Jews and without, without losing sight of all of the other moral complexities that I cited earlier. And, in, and when you face an existential physical threat, one tends to lose sight of those moral complexities. And there, there tends to be a coarsening of moral discourse. I would hope that on the one hand, we will unite in facing the existential physical threats that we could be facing, and at the same time, not lose sight of the complexities that the gift of Jewish power has brought us. Thank you very much. Thank you.